passage that we, Pastor, read today was one of my favorites. Um, and the picture that was drawn in that passage, most powerful, most powerful. But the most powerful part is it nears the end, and the man comes to Christ and says, I'd want to go along with you. And he didn't permit him. Go home to thy friends. And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. Brethren, the most important event that has ever happened since the creation of this world is the coming of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The most important event we could ever understand and learn and grow in in any church is to keep the clear vision of why Christ came. Listen to this proposition. If Christ is the creator, the ruler, and sustainer of all things, the universe, the scripture says, and if his purpose for which he came is not yet completed, and if the church is his bodily instrument for finishing that purpose, then no knowledge is more important than the knowledge of why Christ came to this earth. Grab that, to cling to it, and to apply it. I have some scripture passages to lay before you just to quickly read through them to show that the Bible speaks unmistakably to this very principle. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Mark 10.45 For even the Son of Man came not to, be, not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And the Apostle Paul, out of Romans 15, 8 and 9, says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Then to show that this has been God's purpose from generations, Paul gives these out of 2 Samuel and Deuteronomy and Psalms and Isaiah. For God's purpose is to be glorified by the nations for his mercy's sake. Paul first quotes from 2 Samuel 22.50. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, the Gentiles, the world. Then he quotes Deuteronomy 32.43. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. And he quotes Psalm 117.1. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. Finally, he quotes out of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 10. And then in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. To the Gentiles seek. The point that the Apostle Paul uses by grabbing a hold of these Old Testament passages and laying them before us in Romans 15 is to show that God's purpose in dealing with Israel was always to reach the other nations in order that he would be glorified as they came to know his mercy. Therefore, when God sent his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world, the purpose was not only to conform his promises to Israel, but also, through that, to cause the nations to glorify God for his mercy. So why did the most important event in the world happen? Why did history bring such an event to us? It happened at in fact, that the Aborigines of Australia and the Gola of Liberia and the Yambasa of Cameroon 
and the Gypsies of Yugoslavia and the Hispanics and the Lao and the Hmong and the Ojibwa and those of New Jersey. That someday the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. God's purpose in reaching this world is that they would recognize and glorify him for his mercy. All of the world to reach around. The purpose of Christ's coming is that all peoples of the earth might glorify God for his mercy. And what is this mercy? Simply this, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Or simply put, God sent his Son into the world to save sinners from every nation so that they would glorify him for his mercy. They would indeed, even as we do, glorify him for his mercy. <laughs> the truth is clear and sure to be ever out of everything in the Bible. But there's another truth that is quite clear. This purpose of God sending his son in order that they would glorify him for his mercy is not yet complete. Brother Ricker mentioned that last night in his message. There are hundreds of people groups in this earth whom salvation has yet to be preached, whom the name of Christ is a distant name, a distant word, thousands upon thousands more where his witness is faint, or there is no band of believers to spread such a message. Brethren, do you realize that as of today, one-third of the world's population, about two billion people, have no opportunity to hear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have no scripture in their language. And there, for the most part, are no believers living within their communities at all. Only one in 20,000 Christians go to tell the good news. Only one in 20,000. And 80% of foreign mission groups work among nations that are already nominally Christian. The task is enormous. The opportunities overflowing. That is clear. Well, the third thing that is clear before us this morning is the fact that the mission of Christ to seek and to save those who are lost has been passed on to you and to me. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ, his church. Jesus told his disciples in John 20, 21, As the Father hath sent me, so, what? Send I you. So send I you. <laughs> Fewer things can be clear as you read your Bibles. The purpose of Christ's extended mission in this world. But someone could ask, well, how can you say that when it could very well possibly be that when Jesus told those words, he was speaking only to the disciples, only to the apostles. Those words could only have been to them. But the answer is in the supporting promise when he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that age is still going on, isn't it? He says, My presence is with you. In order that these things would be accomplished, you have been given generation upon generation to this very task to proclaim the gospel of Christ. The apostles are dead and gone, but the purpose remains, I will be with you till the end of the age. You, 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 Christ speaks to our hearts. That promise belongs to the church until the close of the age, and it is the reason that we are empowered. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. But someone might object and say, well, no, the mission to the church of Christ to seek and save those who are lost was passed on to the church, but really specifically to the paid clergy, to the missionaries. Those are the ones who have been specifically ordained to fulfill this task. And I've heard people say that, the vocational workers. Well, there are two answers to that objection. First of all, that it's unthinkable that the cause of Christ, the cause for which Christ came, lived, suffered, and died, should not be the cause for which everybody loves the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason he came and did that which he did, and we read about it, we affirm, 
should not be that which warms all of our hearts and say, I love him for that, and therefore I love that message which needs to be proclaimed. But also, 1 Peter 2.9 says that the whole church, the laity and the clergy, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The whole body, he says, you have been given such a call. And then two verses later, Peter commands all, having your conversations honest, in other words, maintaining good conduct, a good life, among the Gentiles, that they may by your good works, which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. The body, all, he says, by what they see in you, one day, that witness, they may glorify God for his mercy. So the objection will not stand. As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. Means the unfinished work of the Lord Jesus Christ to seek, to save those who are lost, is for all believers, not just clergy, not just missionaries, but yours and mine. He has given us that challenge. Now these three truths are to lead to an in inevitable conclusion of priorities. And I say priorities of the independent board, priorities of the Bible Presbyterian Church, priorities for everyone who stands with us in these very understandable principles. Truth number one, that God sent his son into the world to save sinners from every nation so that they would glorify him for his mercy. That is an absolute truth that the scripture lays for us. The second truth that we talked about, this purpose of God has not yet been completed. In the vernacular of the teens today, duh. <laughs> it is an enormous task that still is ongoing. And then the third truth that Christ has passed on to the church, his mission to seek and save the lost. And as long as this age lasts, our charge from Christ to tell of his salvation from our lips, to show his love from our life, is ours to do so. The conclusion that follows from these three truths is the strategies and the actions to seek and save the lost. It must have a priority in our life. It must have a priority in our church. It must be a priority in our mission. That is the purpose for which Christ came and which we are received the baton. Now let me put these priorities in a wider context and spell them out with some practical implications that we should, I hope, be excited about. There are three biblical priorities of ministry to guide and to measure our success as a body of believers. And you can look at it with the context of the church or the mission board, but I'd like to say, look at it first within your own heart. The first priority is going hard after God. Going hard after a holy God, and we'll talk about what these are. The second priority is helping each other to endure to the end, meeting together and stirring each other up in love and good works. The first, kind of a vertical. The second, horizontal, the strengthening of the body. And the third priority, is moving beyond our Christian fellowship to seek and to save those who are lost, that they may glorify God for his mercy. In other words, the vertical, I'm, I'm seeking after God, I'm, I'm looking to draw closer to him. The horizontal, within the framework of the body of Christ that I seek to grow together with other believers, and then to reach out, thirdly, a priority to reach those who have still yet to hear and to know of the Savior. I think you can test your own maturity as a part of Christ's body as you see how you are doing in these three particular priorities. Again, the first one. Are you going hard after God in prayer, in meditation, and in worship? Listen to these verses, if you would, please. The apostle says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless... And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord. 
priority. Seek hard after God. Paul says, I put it all aside, I've thrown it all away, that I would gain a knowledge of Jesus Christ more and more. And, and let, me, let me inject this. Knowing who Christ is and knowing him are two different things. You can repeat all types of, 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 of biblical truths, and Satan knows it. He can throw out all types of biblical truths, but knowing him personally is what is different. This is what Paul is saying. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, drawing closer, Paul also says in Ephesians 3, that ye may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you hunger for that? That I would know not only this corner but I would know the, the width and the depth and the height and the breadth of the fullness of God, not just a little taste, not just a little sampling, going down the table and, you know, a little, little bite here, a little bite here, but that I would just in, completely envelop my life into Him, that I would know Him. This is what we're talking about, going hard after God in my walk with Him, in my prayer, my meditation, my worship. How am I doing? Secondly, are you meeting with other believers? Personal biblical exhortation and encouragement of faith and love for that purpose. And I say this beyond the context of what we have right here. Do you plan out, do you have time where you meet with other believers around the Word of God where you are able to personally exhort and encourage in love and build each other up? This isn't the the, the, the framework of, of, of a worship service. But you know, there are times when we need to be able to get together around the Word of God and challenge each other, hold each other accountable, pray for something specific in the areas of, of our walk. The body of Christ is so beautifully unique. Listen to what we read in Hebrews 3. Take heed, brethren, pay careful attention, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Great warning. He says the problem is there are those who have departed, have walked away, the deceitfulness of sin. But he says, what is the antidote? The fellowship of believers. He says, take heed, be careful of that. The heart of unbelief, departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily. Who are you enabled with? Who are you linked with on a regular basis that you give spiritual exhortation to? What individual, what group of two or three or five are you on a regular basis tied with that you have such interaction that you can encourage them, pray with them, walk with them during their times. It's necessary, he says, and if we don't, if we're not exhorting one another on a regular basis, our hearts become hardened. My wife knows how I am with a gas tank, you know. And I don't know, maybe some of you other men, we like to get our full tank right down to the very last. Why well, put gas in when you know you, you when you still got a little bit of sliver left of the gas tank, you know? We can drive another 50 miles. And then she leans over and she looks and he says, when's the next gas station coming up? You know? We can't do that with spiritual things. We can't go Sunday to Sunday or Sunday two Sundays away or Sunday three Sundays away and expect that my life is what it ought to be on this horizontal level. You see? And then the third one, am I planning and pursuing my own personal strategies how to seek and to save the lost for the glory of God? 
I regard these three priorities as extremely important. And they're interlinked. Worship towards God, exhortation towards one another, and a witness towards the world. And these priorities intensify as one gets built up. Now think about it. As my worship, as I draw closer to God, all of a sudden I'm going to have not only a greater love for Him, but I'm going to have a greater love for those who are in the body of Christ. And I'm going to have a greater burning desire for those who are still without. As I draw closer to him, he's going to fill my soul. His word is going to become more part of my life. And, and all of a sudden, I find my, my, my viewpoint changes. As I spend time receiving exhortation and love from support groups and the heart of the word of God, pretty soon I'm going to become more excited about drawing closer to God. And I'm going to have a different prospect towards those who are lost. And as I grow in my relationship and my desire to plan to reach those who are lost, it's going to intensify out of necessity the fact that I will grow in with other believers because we need that, you know, the one chord, two chords, three chords, you know, we need that support. And I'm going to grow in that relationship that I have with God. The three of them feed off of each other. They grow together these priorities within our worship. But the most important thing about how these three priorities relate has yet to be said. Because I think the most important priority is number one. Adoring the glory of God from the heart of faith and going hard after him more and more is the starting point and the ending point of our worship, of our ministry, of our Christian life. It is love for God that enables us to come together in small groups of worship and fellowship. But those groups are failures if it doesn't, isn't sourced in the love of God. All too often church groups get together for various kinds of fellowship. But they all of a sudden transfer into food ship or game ship or some other type of ship. But it is not a worship that is drawing us closer to him. That priority one is the starting point and ending point for all Christian nurturing. And the same is true for Christian witness to the world. We should never undertake it if we are not first met and trusted and loved by God. And our joy for his mercy is the starting point for my witness personally and my witness in missions. If I don't see his mercy, in other words, I deserve his judgment and he didn't give it to me. His mercy is great. And how will I ever go on out? What is the goal of mission strategy and personal witness? To seek and to save the lost, yes. But the driving motivation for witness and missions is not fully known until we can say with Paul that the goal for the nations to glorify God for his mercy. Not till they understand, until they know. I don't want us to make the mistake here of separating the two desires for people's salvation and the desire for God to be glorified. They are one. They are one. Objectively, the person receives Christ become passing from, from death unto life. Objectively, he has done that. From condemnation to justification, from alienation to reconciliation. But subjectively, that lost person, as he comes to Christ, ceases to rely upon themselves or their good works or their idols and they rely upon the mercy of God. They cease to glory in themselves and they begin to glory in the cross of Christ and his grace. And while salvation comes to the lost, a new heart is given which glorifies God by trusting in him, enjoying in him, and obeying him. Is that not true? When the heart is changed, yes, he's born again and his stand between him and God is completely changed. But all of a sudden his outlook is different. All of a sudden he says, he is a loving God. I do want to obey him. I am happy in my relationship with him. And he glorifies him for his mercy. He glorifies God for his mercy. Let me draw things to a close with how 
we might be able to use some practical suggestions in how we might move out in our priority number three, our commitment to seek and to save those who are lost, because that's really where we are at this moment. First of all, and I'll just title it and then explain it, pursue the fire. I think every Christian has tasted the fire of adventure, of victory, of a new idea, a new way of investing your life in the joy of meaning. Pursue that fire. There's nothing greater, nothing more thrilling than coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, what will you have me to do? There was a church that Maybe I've shared this with you. Bear with me if I have. When you get my age, you tend to forget things. You remember that, Mrs. Ricker. Um, we had gone to this church, and it was a church of people who were elderly. And um, it was a Wednesday night prayer meeting, and it was my job to do the prayer meeting. And I had a guest speaker come. And I said, would you mind coming with us tonight and just give a message to the people? And we talked about the church and the situation, and we met in there. Uh, prayer room like and, and um, he got up and he gave his testimony how he came to know the Lord and then he says uh, he says you know uh, I don't know any of you and, and from with the time that we have left uh, would you tell me how you came to know the Lord and they were all very quiet and then one stood up and started to recall and then fairly soon after another and then quicker another and another and another and another and another. And then pretty soon he says, we're, we're way out of time. And the time had gone by 45 minutes an hour of just giving testimonies. And the whole atmosphere of the room had changed because the people had revisited the fire of coming to know Christ and what it had meant to them and how it had changed their life. But of all of the years and of all of the battles and of all the things that had taken place, it was just like... We get that way, don't we? We are beaten down by all that is around us in this world. And it just throttles the zeal. It just douses water upon the fire of our soul. Pursue the fire. Go after it. Go hard after this relationship. Last December, I sat around a campfire with 40 junior and senior high schools, and we finished three days of a conference with them. I had six hours to be able to share with them the goal of missions. And as we sat around that campfire, I said, I'd love to have you all say, hey, yes, I'm ready for missions. But what I want you to do is just, at your time, ask God if you are willing to covenant with him and your fellow friends around here that you would pray for missions. And one by one, a hand went up, and I said, no, I want you to say it. And one by one, up, they stood up and they says. I am going to, this year, covenant to pray daily for missions. Half of them did that. A little over 20 of those who were there at that time. The zeal of, of what was heard through the word of God and, and culminating to the point to say that this is what I'm going to do. And I says, I want you to do it publicly so your classmates, your fellow friends and so forth can see and hold you accountable to that. The fire to keep burning in each other. Sometimes the log falls off the fire and, and as it sits outside, it kind of slowly dissipates and it's out. But pick the log back up and put it back within the pile and it all of a sudden gets caught up with the flame once again. Pursue the fire of this relationship that the Lord has given us. What fans the coals of your heart for missions, pursue it. Secondly, Plan your own personal strategy. Brethren, we are all different, and that's not accidental. <laughs> we are all different, different backgrounds, different family, different traits, different characteristics, different qualities, and there are inferiorities and superiorities that fit you perfectly, contributing to you and only to you. We are unique individuals by the hand of the Master. But it won't happen to use those if you don't plan. Think about every part of your life and ask, how should my commitment to priority affect what I wear, what I eat, where I recreate, 
what I read, what I watch, what I do, what house I go to, what job I take, what groups I belong to, how I pray with my children or I pray with my parents, which way I walk to the store, and so forth. I am unique. We're all unique individuals. But I need to plan my life in order that I would prioritize. It's too far vague to be able to say, I live for the glory of God. All of us need to be more specific in integrating that vision for our lives. Streamlining and strategizing how to be uniquely you in a personal witness in your own community and for an overseas vision of missions that will provide you with a very specific direction for your life and bring more glory to God than any other integrating vision. I'm sure here this morning some of you are saying, well, you're talking to us like you're thinking we're all thoroughbreds ready to jump out of the stall here and to run a quarter mile race when in fact we feel like we ought to be hospitalized, you know? Come on, Pastor, get real. That might be so. But don't forget the healing and the nurturing of the priority of that number two. In other words, feeding off of each other. The groups, the responsibilities that we have for each other in growing together. I want you to consider it possible. Could it possibly be that you and your family are maybe having some difficulties in life because you're lacking a noble adventure? A noble adventure of serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and I truly mean it out of the sincerest of my heart. The particular qualities that you've been given, the place that you live, what you're doing, that you are, they're just life is just eh, because you've never really had such an adventure set before you and you've planned to do it, to follow through with it. You may feel frustrated and often guilty and fearful and then irritable and life is just an ever downward spiral of, of boredom and meaninglessness and petty problems. Could it be that you need to be on the front lines? Life is just eh. That's because we're always in the back. We're not up in the front. We're not doing that and being engaged in the things we ought to. Plan a strategy. I believe that more families and more individuals and personal problems, all of the things that we would have imagined, could be healed indirectly if individuals and families turned outward and threw themselves towards the greatest cause that this world has ever known. Bringing Christ to the nation. I think there'll be a lot of changes that will take place. So pursue the fire, plan a personal strategy. Third, participate in some small group devoted to outreach or missions. Well, Women's Missionary Society meets for how many months out of the year? Ten? Ten? Ladies, you ought to know. Ten? Thank you. Ten months out of the year, you know, and the other two months during the summertime, you know. And I've been to enough of them to say that seven, eight, nine, ten ladies will come. And maybe men sometimes stand on the outside and be able to say, well, that's Women Missionary Society. It doesn't say women's and men's, uh, just not for us, you know. It doesn't always work like that. And I'm sure if that was ever the case that they would welcome you in. And men or young people, if you feel offended at going to the Women's Missionary Society as they set aside time to specifically strategize and pray for missions, then why don't you start your own group? Why don't you start a men's group for prayer? Pastor, you meet on Saturday morning for prayer, praying for things. I don't think as, as, as little as this man does around here, if a couple of men came together and said, Pastor, we'd like to do something for missions as men, I don't think he would say, you know, my, I'm kind of busy right now. I don't think I've got the time. I don't think that would ever come out of his mouth. You see what I'm saying? 
when it remains in the big group and when the, the, this part's over here, it leaves me far away from ever participating in anything that I can bring my particular skills or knowledge or desire or whatever it is collectively together with those that we can pray with. And if you don't want to do it with pastor, get with some others and just say, listen, we're going to do this for missions. Strategize. Fourthly, Perform some specific act to put yourself in touch with unbelievers. I've written a couple of these down, and you can probably go on with the list. Invite neighbors for dessert. Go for walks in your neighborhood. Watch for needs that you can meet. Read some simple books on basic Christianity and buy some extra books to give out. Play racquetball at the Y. Eat lunch with a different colleague. Do some volunteer work in the community, so on and so on and so on. Put yourself purposely in touch with somebody else who needs Christ. Do that. Planning a strategy means that I've got to get out of my old rut and get myself into a place where I can share that which Christ has given me. That the nations may indeed glorify God for his mercy. There are hundreds of ways that paths can cross with unbelievers. And if you find the ones that fit you, Pray that God will use you, and it will amaze you that Christ still loves to seek and to save those who are lost through you. Last of all, join in the dream for leadership development. I'm convinced that the independent board and our churches should, Lord willing, be uniquely equipping a strategic role to play in leadership building for the cause of missions until the Lord returns. And I say that simply because we need people to do that. You know, I think the reason Jesus crossed the sea, the country of the Gadarenes, is because he had a strategy. Yes, he wanted to get away from the crowds, and, and that was going to be a quiet place to go to, away from all of the hustle and bustle of what was on the other side of Galilee. But as he crossed over there, Jesus had something in mind. Just across the Sea of Galilee lay Decapolis, a cluster of Gentile cities where there was no witness of his saving power. He had devoted with his disciples to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he had the heart for the unreached Gentiles of Decapolis, so he crossed the lake, healed the demonic ridden man, and when the man wanted to accompany Jesus back across to the other side, he says, No. I have 82 missionaries covering the land of the Jews, and you are uniquely fit to meet the needs of the Gentiles in Decapolis. Go serve there. And I think that's what I call strategy. That was the man equipped. And Jesus had a plan, and it worked. Given the way I feel about the gross imbalance of how many Christian leaders there are in America, there is no way that I could stay here and say that I not believe that through the independent board and our own churches that we cannot provide leadership for overseas and planning for missions. In a mighty act of power and commission, our Lord Jesus Christ prepared and sent witnesses, leaders to unreached peoples. More and more planning must be in that direction building of leadership training grounds, seedbed for launching pads, in order that these things would be accomplished. Right now, a lot of the work that the independent board does is in training of men for the ministry, the gospel ministry. Bible colleges and seminary level classes, training men and women for the ministry, in order that another generation would be prepared for that work. As a simple matter of fact, these things must be prayed for. And so let me say, pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest. Shall we pray? Father, we are helpless and hopeless without you. We lived in our day in darkness without the Savior, not knowing where we were going or what we would do. We lived upon our own strength, the strength of the flesh, and we walked among those who we, we fed off of. 
And yet one day the seed of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ came to our ears and into our hearts, and it brought forth fruit of repentance, and it brought us to not only to a saving knowledge of the Savior, but it brought us into a full working knowledge where we wanted to love him more and serve him even greater. Our path has not been an easy one, Lord, and yet yours was not either. And so when you had commanded those apostles and even into our hearts today that we were to be equipped in order that this work might be carried on through our hands and through our feet and through our eyes and our mouths and our ears and our hearts, we said, Lord, we can't. But you said that you would be with us to the very end. We find ourselves encouraged and strengthened in some small way to glorify you in all that you have done and are doing now and will do. Oh God, raise up another generation. Raise up men and women who are willing to serve, to tell their neighbors of the Lord Jesus Christ, to go to the far distant lands where you would call them and equip them in order that they too may give you praise for your mercy. And we thank you in our Savior's name.